we could take our Bibles and open them to the book of Romans chapter 1. And you're saying, oh no, not again. <laughs> the Lord really must want us in this passage. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, the, the title of our session this afternoon is America Under the Judgment of God. The answer is yes, so let's close in prayer. <laughs> uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse, uh, verse 18. Well, when we talk about uh, countries, by the way, he, he was on the subject of books. I'm happy to say our Middle East meltdown book that you promoted yesterday, we sold out. So, but the good news is, uh, we've got it available on Amazon. So if you want a Kindle version of it, uh, you can find that on Amazon.com, or you can order it uh, paperback as well. Is America under the judgment of God? Well, that kind of raises an interesting question. Does God actually judge countries? Or does he just judge humans? Here's what uh, George Mason said. Now, George Mason was very uh, instrumental in our Bill of Rights. He's sometimes called the father of the Bill of Rights. He's sometimes called the father of the Second Amendment. And George Mason said this, as nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, so they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. So this is a very interesting quote I ran across that George Mason uh, communicates. A country, unlike a human being, doesn't have an eternal soul. So therefore, if a country doesn't have an eternal soul, God is not going to judge a country in the next life. He judges humans in the next life. So therefore, any judgment that God does on a nation, he does it in this life. So George Mason was very much of the opinion that nations do experience the judgment of God. Now, I like what Billy Graham, I think this quote's attributed to Billy Graham. He said, if God doesn't judge America, then he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Who said it? Ruth Graham, okay, one of the Grahams. Maybe, maybe Ruth got it from Billy or somebody, but it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific quote. Now, when we talk about the judgment of God, most of us are sitting around looking for a lightning bolt, some kind of cataclysm, uh, a meteor hitting the planet. I mean, what's, what, what are we talking about with the judgment of God? And what you discover is when you begin to look at this biblically, is the wrath of God manifests itself in many different forms. There is uh, what we would call the historical wrath of God. Sodom and Gomorrah certainly would be an example of that. There is something that we would call the eschatological or the future wrath of God. We can read about that in the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19. There is sometimes a form of, uh, I don't want to call this wrath, but it's a, it's a judgment or a discipline that God imposes on his own people because whom the Lord loves, the Lord what? Chastens, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. There is also a principle of sowing and reaping in the Bible, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be mocked. Uh, do not be deceived, rather, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. A lot of consequences we bear because we just put bad seed into the ground. And uh, the Bible says we reap what we sow in that extent. But there's a... Uh, Another form of wrath that really doesn't get a lot of uh, headlines from evangelical pulpits, and I call this the doctrine of divine abandonment. And that's where I'd like to focus our attention in this session. 
Sometimes the wrath of God is expressed as God withdraws his presence. For example, take the character Samson. Judges 16 and verse 20, it says this, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep, and he said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Saul, uh, the first king of the nation of Israel, experienced this form of wrath. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So sometimes the wrath of God is something where you go out and you expect his presence and you expect his blessing, and what you begin to discover is that presence and that blessing is withdrawn. I believe that this fifth form of wrath is something that America is currently under as we speak. And that's why I had you turn to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. It's probably the section of the scripture that best uh, communicates this idea. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working through this this afternoon, verse by verse. But before we get there, uh, the actual verse by verse study, just to kind of orient you to the entire book of Romans, if I can do that very quickly. The book of Romans is about the righteousness of God. A righteousness of God has been disclosed and revealed through the gospel. And here is a uh, several part outline of the book of Romans. It's a typical approach. Each section begins with the letter S. You have the salutation or the greeting. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Sin, chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20. Then Paul gets to the gospel, or salvation, chapter 3, verse 21 through the end of chapter 5. And then it's all about how to grow in the gospel, something that we call progressive sanctification, 6 through 8. And then, have you been in a Bible class where they teach Romans 1 through 8 and they stop the class? You say, wait a minute, I thought there was a chapter 9, 10, and 11 here. And most uh, Protestant interpreters, quite frankly, stop their series at that point because they don't know what to do with all this Jewish stuff. But Paul in Romans 9, 10, and 11 basically is saying God has not forgotten Israel. Because if God can forget his covenants with Israel, everything else that he has said in this book to us as church age believers, is really not worth the, the paper it's printed on, is it? So he vindicates the fact that God has not forgotten Israel. Then you get to Romans 12, 1 through chapter 15, verse 13. That section begins by saying, offer your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Now how can I offer my body as a living sacrifice to a God that's untrustworthy? Oh, he's not untrustworthy because he's not even going to forget his promises to Israel. So I can offer him myself in service now that his trustworthiness has been vindicated. And then you sort of get to the end of the book and it's a summation, if in a sense he's saying hello and goodbye and greetings to a lot of his close ministry associates. What we are focused on here is number two in the outline, sin. Now, this is a rough section because Paul here doesn't mention Jesus a single time. He doesn't mention the love of God a single time. He doesn't mention the gospel a single time. He doesn't talk about how to get saved. He just talks about where we are without the gospel. And uh, when I was teaching this verse by verse in our local church, I noticed that our attendance dropped off quite a bit when I was in this section. But Paul is setting up an argument, and in fact, you might be surprised to learn this, that they used to use in law schools, it's changed a bit now, but they used to use the book of Romans as an example to teach attorneys how to lay out a case, because Romans is so logically structured. And the reason Paul is not talking about the gospel in that section is because, as Dwight Moody said, you've got to get a man lost before you can get him saved, right? I mean, why reach out as a drowning man for the gospel if I don't even know I'm drowning? 
So in that section, we learn that we are drowning in sin. Paul condemns the Gentiles, the rest of chapter 1. He condemns the moralist, first half of chapter 2. The moralist is the person that says, I'm a good person. No, you're not. He condemns unbelieving Jews, chapter 2, verse 17, through chapter 3, verse 8. Now, don't mistake that, as God has forgotten Israel, because we know in chapters 9, 10, and 11 that he hasn't. And then Paul kind of starts to talk a little Texan here at the end of chapter 3, where he doesn't just say y'all, he says all (laughs) y'all. Now, coming from California to Texas, I didn't even know what that meant, but here's 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 how it works. Y'all means a smaller group. All (laughs) y'all is everybody. So... Prior to chapter 3, he's just said y'all, and now he's saying all y'all. So he's saying the whole world is guilty in God. So what we're focused on here is chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 32. Now I have to warn you, there's a lot of bad news here. But I promise you that when we get to the end of this presentation, I'm going to leave on a note of optimism. I'm going to give you some things that are good and positive. So I just want to warn you, we're kind of moving into some difficult terrain here. But notice the bad news. Here's an outline, if you will, of chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 32. You have the revelation of and the reason for God's wrath, verse 18. You have number two, God's self-revelation in creation renders mankind inexcusable verses 19 through 20. Then you have the results of mankind's rejection of God, verses 21 through 23. And then you have the chapter ending with God abandoning mankind to its passions and its consequences. And if you want to understand where the United States of America is today, I believe that this is the section of Scripture that most graphically depicts our present state in God as currently under his wrath. So let's uh, develop this a little bit, shall we? Notice, uh, if you will, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, uh, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. First thing we see here is the revelation of God's wrath. In fact, it's this word revelation, the noun form of it is apocalypsis, which means revelation or disclosure. In fact, that's the very title of the book of Revelation, which is a disclosure of God's end time program. That's why it always cracks me up when I hear people say, the book of Revelation can't be understood. Well, the very title of the book is The Unveiling. Of course it can be understood. So the wrath of God is disclosed. In other words, we're not waiting for the wrath of God. The wrath of God is already happening in terms of divine abandonment. Now, this word translated wrath in verse 18 is the Greek word orge. Uh, there's a lot of sexual imagery that comes from orge, um, orgy, for example. Uh, orge is the idea of passion without limits. Passion that has no controls on it at all. And here it's not being used in the sexual sense, it's being used in the emotional sense. And what it's saying is God, when he looks at this world has uncontrolled anger and wrath. I think it was Jonathan Edwards in his famous sermon called this Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That's a pretty good description of what Paul is saying here in Romans 1 and verse 18. When God looks at planet Earth, he's ticked off. Now, unless we understand this bad news, we don't even appreciate our need for the gospel. That's why Paul is being so graphic in this. And, well, what's God upset about? Paul says, I'm, I'm glad you've asked that question. 
Notice uh, the reason for God's wrath. Notice the second part of verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What is God upset about? He's upset about two things. Number one, ungodliness. And number two, unrighteousness. Well, Paul, can you unpack that a little bit for us? What, are you, what exactly do you mean by ungodliness and unrighteousness? Paul says, I'm glad you asked that question. Verse 18 continues on. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, some translations translate that restrain, who suppress or restrain the truth in unrighteousness. Apparently God has disclosed something, we're going to learn more about it as we go through the chapter, and the human mind has taken what is obvious, what should be self-evident, and actively suppressed it. Suppress here is an active verb. Humanity, as God looks at the human race, is doing something related to the disclosure of God and the, act, the active suppression of it. And this is uh, where the whole subject of uh, objectivity comes in. A lot of people think, you know, people are objective. If we can just give them the right argument, they'll convert to Christianity. And that ignores the fact that there is no such thing as objectivity. If you do not have the new nature and you do not have the Holy Spirit inside of you, your nature is biased against God. It is actively suppressing truth, which should be self-evident. And this takes us to the second part of the outline, verses 19 and 20, where we learn that God's self-revelation in creation renders mankind in, inexcusable. Now notice verses 19 and 20 where we learn about God has disclosed something. This is what humanity is suppressing. He's, humanity is suppressing something very clearly that God has re revealed. And let's read about that if we could, verses 19 and 20. It says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. God has revealed himself in what we would call creation. Every human being should look around this world and they should know that God exists. Isn't it interesting that of all of the six to seven billion people on planet earth, no two fingerprints are alike? Isn't it interesting that of all of the snowflakes that have fallen in human history, when you examine them under a microscope, no two snowflakes are exactly identical? Isn't it interesting that in our heliocentric solar system with the earth revolving around the sun, we revolve around the sun at, at just the right orbit? We're not so close to the sun that we burn to death. We're not so far away from the sun that we freeze to death. And here we are orbiting at exactly the right distance from the sun to sustain life. I mean, look at this from God's point of view. Here, here we are <laughs> rotating around the sun at just the right orbit, and, and these little peon creatures called human beings are debating about whether God even exists. I mean, God must just get a laugh out of this whole thing. And so we uh, uh, have the disclosure of God through creation. Before you even go to church, before you read the Bible, before you hear the name Jesus, Every human being knows that God uh, exists. It's, it's very obvious. You don't have design without a what? Designer. I've never seen a tornado or a hurricane go through a junkyard 
and assemble a 747 aircraft. If you have a design, you have a designer. I mean, this isn't front page news. This is just common sense. And the fact of the matter is, God has already revealed himself in something that we call general revelation. Now, there's a difference between general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is things like nature and conscience that we're reading about here in Romans 1 and 2. Special revelation is something more specific, like the incarnation of Christ, scripture, miracles. General revelation is available to everybody. Special revelation is available to some. That's why we have to send out missionaries with Bibles, because there's parts of this world, even today, that don't have access to a scripture in their own language. General revelation renders mankind accountable. Human beings are accountable to search for truth because God has revealed himself and disclosed himself. Special revelation, though, will give you the specific information that, that's necessary to get to heaven. A revelation of Jesus and faith alone in Christ alone for salvation. General revelation is in non-written, non-verbal form, typically. Special revelation is in written form. It would be our Bible. General revelation is natural. We see it all around us. Special revelation typically is miraculous when you look at the incarnation of Christ or how the scriptures came into existence, uh, a, a miracle of God. What Paul is talking about here is general revelation. God has basically disclosed to the human race two Bibles, the Bible of creation, which is called general revelation, and then the Bible that we're holding in our hands, these 66 books that we call special revelation. And what you have to understand is the United States government is based on general revelation. This is what the uh, founding fathers, I believe, particularly Thomas Jefferson, was thinking about when they crafted our Declaration of Independence. It's this idea that God exists. We know that he exists. He's disclosed himself. And if God exists, then there are certain God-given rights that we all have. So the Declaration of Independence, we'll talk about the laws of nature and nature's God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That kind of sounds like Paul, doesn't it? that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And then the Declaration of Independence goes on. And we, I mentioned this in my first presentation yesterday, we ought to praise God that we live in a country where there's something called unalienable rights. Isn't it interesting the United States government starts with God? The Declaration of Independence, America's birth certificate, starts with God. Now, does the United Nations Declaration start with God? No, it doesn't. You know what it starts with? The United Nations. Rights come from the United Nations. Well, if the United Nations giveth a right, the United Nations can what? Taketh a right. Not so in the United States of America, because the United States government never granted rights to begin with. The United States government is founded on the idea of the recognition of rights that are already in existence, unalienable rights. And therefore, the function of government is to protect those rights. And how this basic idea is forgotten by people at the highest level of government. This is Janet Reno. She was the Attorney General in the Clinton Justice Department. Now Clinton and Justice, I don't know if those two words even go well together. It's what we would call an oxymoron or a self-contradicting statement. It's like saying Microsoft works. Uh, jumbo shrimp. Uh, Postal Service, <laughs> Government Intelligence, and my personal favorite, Reasonable Attorney's Fees. <laughs> but look at what she says here, and I, I just quote her because it shows you how far we are from the design of our Founding Fathers. She says this, you are part of a government that has given its people more freedom than any other government in the history of the world. 
That is such a fundamental, foundational misunderstanding of the United States of America by the Attorney General of that era. She's saying that rights come to the people from the government. No, they do not. The Declaration of Independence is very clear that rights come to the people from God. And that uh, moves us on now into the, uh, well, a little bit more as we continue on. What does this self-disclosure of God do? And this explains, verse 18, why God is so upset, why the, the orge or the wrath of God has been kindled against humanity. The self-disclosure of God renders, the moment God reveals something to you, you're held accountable for what he has revealed. And he says that there, if you look at the end of verse 20, after it says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Look at the last part of verse 20. So that they are without what? Excuse. God's expectation, which I think is fairly reasonable, is that humans would see what he has revealed in creation and would glorify him. You know, when I look at a beautiful painting like by Picasso, I want to glorify Picasso because he's the creator. When I read a, a, a Shakespearean masterpiece and I'm overwhelmed by that literature, I want to glorify Shakespeare because he is the creator. That's, that's natural. So what, is the, what does God expect? God says, I have created this masterpiece that you're living in and dependent on me for. And I, what I expect is that you would give me the basic glory that I deserve. And you see, this is why the theory of evolution, you know the theory of evolution from the zoo to the goo to you, <laughs> over billions of years, or better said, from goo to you by way of the zoo, whichever one you like, is such an abomination to God. Because it takes something that God created and it attributes, not God for what exists, but some kind of natural cause. God is removed from the equation. The book of Revelation chapter four, verse 11 says this. It's a tremendous worship scene. It says, worthy are you, see it's worship there. Worthy are you, our Lord, and our God to receive glory, honor, and power for you, what? Created all things. The expectation of God is that the human race, which is depraved, would still recognize God, worship God, glorify God on, the, on account of what he has made because that's what the angels are doing in heaven. That's what the four living creatures are doing in heaven. That's what the 24 elders, who we believe is the raptured church, is doing in heaven as well. A key point in all of this is what Jesus said in Luke 12, 48. For everyone who has been given much will be what? Much will be what? Required. To whom much is given, much is expected. The more a person has an awareness of God, the more God expects that person to respond to the truth. And since God has written a Bible called General Revelation, accessible to everybody, the whole human race is accountable. That's Paul's point. Now you say, well, what about the United States of America? How does all of this fit in with that? And people ask me this all of the time. They say, you think... You think America is under the judgment of God? Well, every nation is under the judgment of God. In a, in a sense, they're right. But people say, what makes America different? What makes America special? And here's the distinguishing marker. America, more than any other nation in the history of the world, other than Israel herself, a special creation of God, other than Israel herself, America has been given more light than any other civilization in human history. So the expectation of God is that America would respond to truth. Has America been given light? 
Look at this quote here from Sir, Sir William Blackstone. This is the foundation of American law, going all the way back to colonial America and even before. Blackstone's commentaries on the law. He says, thus when the supreme being formed the universe and created matter out of nothing, he imposed certain principles upon that matter from which it could never depart and without which it could cease to be. If we farther advance from mere inactive matter to vegetable and animal life, we shall find them still governed by laws more numerous indeed, but equally fixed and invariable. Man considered as a creature must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator, for he is entirely a a dependent being. Watch this. No human law should be suffered to contradict the laws of nature and the laws of revelation. Blackstone said, God has disclosed himself in two forms, general revelation and the scripture. So if we're going to be good lawyers and legislatures, let's pass laws that cooperate with the fixed principles of God as revealed in these two Bibles. That's the origin of American jurisprudence right there. And we're not going to be passing laws that contradict those principles. That's why sodomy, as you study it in Blackstone's commentaries on the law, is called a crime against nature. He says we can't have laws favoring sodomy, because after all, Romans 1 condemns it, and nature itself condemns it. So let's pass laws that cooperate with these fixed principles rather than rebel against them. Times have changed, haven't they? Christopher Columbus, references have been made to this already. This is the origin of America. He writes this in a book called The Book of Prophecies. Our Lord opened my understanding. I could sense his hand upon me. So it became clear to me that the voyage was feasible. All those who heard of my enterprise rejected it with laughter, scoffing at me. Who doubts this illumination was from the Holy Spirit who comforted me with marvelous rays of light, consoled me with the holy and sacred scriptures. They inflame within me a sense of urgency. No one should be afraid to take on any enterprise in the name of the Savior if it is right and if the purpose is purely for his holy service. And I say that the sign that convinces me that our Lord is hastening the end of the world is the preaching of the gospel in so many distant lands. That's the motivation of the voyage of Columbus in his own words. The Holy Spirit was all over this man. His, his, his knowledge of the scriptures was impelling him to make this voyage. Consequently, they came here, and over time, we've, we've studied in this conference the Mayflower Compact, America's first governmental charter. 1620, it says, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and, a, uh, and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. The whole point of America was to glorify God and to preach the gospel. That's why when the early pilgrims came here, they passed what is called the old Satan deluder law. And this was the origin of public schools in the United States of America. This is how public schools started. It says, it being one of the chief, it being one chief project of that old Satan, that old deluder Satan to keep men from a knowledge of the scripture, as in former times, it is therefore ordered that after the Lord hath increased the settlement, they shall appoint one within their town to teach all such children to read, that they shall set up grammar schools to instruct the youth. Let's set up grammar schools to teach kids how to write and read so they can understand the Bible. Let's teach them grammar so they can understand the Bible. Because we certainly don't want to go back to the former time. See the reference to the former time there in that statement? What former time? These people that came to this country were the descendants of those that were involved in what was called the Protestant Reformation in Europe. What was the Protestant Reformation? It was a reaction to what's called the Dark Ages. 
a terrible time in history where illiteracy reigned. The only people that had access to the scripture were the clergy. The clergy wildly allegorized the Bible. And the clergy uh, basically set themselves up as a priesthood that said you can't understand the Bible unless you come through us. And the clergy took advantage of the ignorance of the people. This is what upset Martin Luther with uh, the sale of indulgences. You want to spring Uncle Harry out of purgatory? You need to pay the clergy the right money. And they didn't have access to the Bible to even know if... Purgatory was a biblical doctrine. When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. That was the statement. Sale of indulgences. The Protestant Reformation is a reaction against that. That's why there's such an emphasis on literacy and what is called the priesthood of all believers, that everybody can read the Bible for themselves. And so when the descendants of those involved in that Reformation came to these shores, the first thing they did is they said, we're going to set up public schools, by the way, in Massachusetts, not exactly a bastion of evangelical Christianity today. Would you agree with that? We're going to set up public schools in Massachusetts, and we're going to teach people how to read so they can understand the Scripture for themselves, so we don't have a, a, a replication of the nightmare that we just came out of. That's, and, and people are telling me today the founding fathers didn't want the Bible taught in the school, don't want the Bible taught in the schools. What are we talking about? Do we not understand our history anymore? This is how many of our founding fathers were taught to read through the New England primer. A, in Adam's sin we all fall. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. And I was so impressed with this, we got a New England primer, and this is how we taught our daughter uh, the alphabet. This is the origin of America. You ever heard of this Bible college, Harvard University? This is the beginning of Harvard University, 1636. This is a whole full century and a half before the American Revolution. This is the rules of the school. Let every, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider, well, the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Notice they quote John 17, 3. And therefore to lay Christ at the bottom as the foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in, seek, in secret to seek it of him. Proverbs 2 and 3. Everyone shall exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day, that he shall be ready, uh, proficient to give his account therein. Benjamin Franklin, he wrote a track, and the, the point of the track is Europeans need to come over here to America. Come on in, the water's fine. And he writes this track, and this is what he says, hence bad examples of youth are more rare in America. Atheism is unknown there. Infidelity rare and secret. So that Great persons may live to a great age in that country without having their piety shocked by meeting either atheist or infidel. John Jay, this was made reference in our conference, America's first uh, Chief Justice to the United States Supreme Court. He says, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. The United States Supreme Court, in a case called the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, unanimously... Now, it's not a narrow decision. We have these 5-4 decisions today, don't we? This baby is unanimous. All the justices side on to this. And this is what uh, David Josiah Brewer said in that decision, 1892, after citing 87 historical precedents. 
America is a Christian nation. This is historically true from the discovery of this continent to the present hour. There is a single voice making this affirmation. These are not the sayings and declarations of private persons. They are organic utterances. They speak the voice of the entire people. These and many other matters which may, might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. And how I wish he was on the Supreme Court today. What am I getting at here? America has light. God, therefore, expects America to respond to the light that she has. That is a basic uh, expectation of God, to whom much is given much is required. So this takes us into the third part of our outline, the results of mankind's rejection against God. Notice verses 21 through 23. First of all, mankind rejects a knowledge of God, verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks. How can Paul say to pagans that they knew God? I thought pagans by definition don't know God. Oh, but you see, pagans do know God because God has disclosed himself through his great Bible called general revelation. The pagan or the unbeliever suppresses the truth, but in their heart of hearts, they know that God exists. And I, I sometimes just feel sorry for the unbeliever. Think how their unbelieving mind has to work overtime to explain away what's obvious. That's why that active verb of suppress or restrain is used. You know, the unbeliever, the non-Christian, they wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Because in their heart of hearts, they know God exists. And yet the unbelieving mind starts going to work to explain away the obvious. That's the state of the unbeliever. That's the state that we were all in prior to trusting in Christ for salvation. You know, it's not going to be like on the day of judgment, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins is going to be surprised that God exists. Oh my gosh, I had no idea you were there. Dawkins knows he's there. Madeline Murray O'Hare knows he's there. Especially her, yeah. But they're involved in uh, suppression. They knew God, yet they did not honor God or give him thanks. Look at what these evolutionists do. They promote themselves as objective scientists, and yet they say things like this. You, you know evolution. From the goo to you by way of the zoo, as we have said. By the way, these books here, if you have any problems with evolution or think it's credible, these books here uh, refute it from top to bottom. But here's an evolutionist, I'm not quoting a fundamentalist Christian here, an evolutionist, links, by the way, why do we call this link the missing link? Because it's still what? Missing. Links are, we need this transitional evidence from one uh, species to another. Links are missing just where we most fervently, what, desire them to be. And it's all too probable that links will continue to be missing. We want them to be there. But the evidence isn't there yet. But we're going to keep looking because we know we can make this theory work. Another evolutionist says gradualism, that's another way of saying evolution, is a concept I believe in. Gould and the American Museum people are... Hard to contradict when they say they are no, there are no transitional fossils, yet you say that I should show a photo of a fossil from which each type of organism was derived. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil from which one could make an airtight argument. It is easy enough to make up stories of how one form gave rise to another 
and find reasons why the stages should be favored by natural selection, but such stories are not part of science, for there is no way of putting them to the test. You know, I was raised in the public school system, and I saw all these pictures of what the missing link looks like, only to discover later on that that was just flowery artwork. And what they really found was like a tooth of an extinct pig or something like that, and they developed a whole caricature around it. Because they're so certain they can make this theory work, it's just a matter of time before we find the evidence. By the way, if you talk to somebody involved in criminal investigations, and forensics, and they're good at what they do, someone in law enforcement, they, they'll tell you this, that we never try to develop a theory on the case too early. We never try to say that guy did it or that person did it because once you buy into a theory, the temptation is to try to make the evidence fit your what? Theory rather than build your theory from the evidence. That's called scholarship. And evolutionists, I believe, are some of the poorest scholars on the planet because they're admitting here in print that they're not building their theory from the facts. They're trying to make the facts fit a preconceived theory. And this is why God is angry. See? Well, why is evolution so popular? Charles Ryrie sums it up the best. The evolutionary origin of man relieves man of responsibility to a creator outside of himself. BLT, bottom line time, that's the whole game right there. If I can explain creation away without a creator, I'm God. And I can make my own rules. And that's why people gravitate towards this view despite its intellectual insufficiency and sloppiness. And this is why God is angry. Because God expects a response based on what is obvious. Now, can we apply this to America? The, the origin of America is obvious. We've heard all the evidence in this conference. God expects the President of the United States, the Congress, the Supreme Court, everybody in a position of authority, the American people, the American clergy, to be screaming out and praising God for his glory. In fact, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, said this. The birthday of the nation is, and by the way, when I quote these uh, uh, people, these are all quotes I've looked up on my own. Uh, I try to rely on primary sources rather than finding them in a book because many times they can get misquoted. The birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior and forms a leading event in the progress of the gospel dispensation. The Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon the earth and laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. He said that in a 4th of July address. He says there are two sacred holidays in the United States of America, at least two. Number one, Christmas, which celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ, and number two, the 4th of July, because Jesus gave birth to the United States of America. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, said that. That's expected because of what God has done. And yet, what happens? They did not honor him. They did not give thanks to him, leading to two results. Number one, their thinking became darkened. I'm getting that in the second part of verse 21 and into verse 22. After it says in verse 21, they did not honor him nor give him thanks. What does it say? But they became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became what? Fools. Psalm 14 in verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no what? God. Proverbs 1.7, 
And this verse has been misquoted a couple times at this conference. So I want to correct the record here. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning, not of wisdom. Other verses say that, but not at the beginning of Proverbs. It's very clear. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the ability to think and acquire data. Wisdom is the ability to apply the data. It's not even making a comment here about wisdom. It's making a comment here about knowledge. You get smart through a submission to God. And if you won't submit to God, you become dumb or stupid. That's what Paul is saying. You know, I get these comments, you know, what, what's going on with Satan? Why doesn't Satan, doesn't Satan know he can't win? Let me tell you something about Satan. In Ezekiel 28, verse 17, it says, You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Satan's brain doesn't work correctly because he rejected a knowledge of God. That's why he thinks he can win this. He's not, you're not dealing with an entity that's logical or rational. When you reject a knowledge of God, our thinking, Paul just said it right here, becomes speculative, futile. Our intellectual abilities become darkened. And how are our SAT scores doing? I got this from uh, David Barton's very good book, Original Intent. You notice that our SAT scores were hovering at a certain point in public schools until that big line there? That's the year 1963. And right after 1963, you'll notice this precipitous decline. Well, what happened in 1963? Did a meteor hit the planet? Did something enter the water? No. 1963 is the year we threw what? God out of the public schools. Because the fool has said in his heart there is no God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. What's the excuse of the politicians? Well, let's just pour more money into the system. I don't care how much money you pour into the system, it's still not going to work because you've rejected a fundamental truth that we become intelligent through submission to God. Rejection of God, living independent of God, causes my mind to become darkened. And beyond that, verse 23 says, we become idolaters. Notice, if you will, verse 23. And they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. What does man start to do in his darkened state? He starts to worship the creation rather than the creator. That is where America is today. We worship the earth instead of the God that made the earth. How dumb is that? We are into something called Gaia. According to the Gaia hypothesis, we are parts of a greater whole. If we endanger her, she will dispense with us in the interest of higher life, that is life itself. We're acting like the earth is God. And if we don't treat the earth correctly, she will retaliate against us. Gaia is Mother Earth. Gaia is immortal. She is the eternal source of life. She does not need to reproduce herself because she is mortal. She is the mother of us all, including Jesus. Nice of them to give a little hat tip to poor little Jesus there. The one who spoke and the heavens and the earth left into existence. Gaia is not a tolerant mother. She is rigid and inflexible and ruthless in the destruction of whoever transgresses her unconscious objective. See how they're attributing uh, attributes to an inanimate object? Her unconscious objective is that of maintaining a world adopted to life. If we men hinder this objective, we will be eliminated with, without pity. Again, the great theologian Danny Glover, <laughs> who's trying to explain the Haiti earthquake. What happened in Haiti could happen anywhere in the Caribbean because all of these islands are in peril because of global warming, Glover said. When you see what we did at the climate summit in Copenhagen, this is the response, this is what happens, you know what I'm saying. 
So we didn't treat the earth right in 2009 at the Copenhagen United Nations meeting, and so the earth got even with us through the Haiti earthquake. What is this? This is idolatry. This is what happens when you push God out of your consciousness and out of your mind. This is what happens when you reject what is obvious that God exists. And this is where America is. And so what happens is God puts America under judgment, not through a cataclysm necessarily, but through abandonment. God gives us over in his judgment to what we want. Notice, if you will, verse 24, as God now is abandoning mankind to its passions and consequences. Look at verse 24. Some of the scariest words in the Bible, verse 24. For God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts. Is this a theme here? Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over. Look at verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. It says it three times. By the way, God has a tremendous sense of humor. Did you know that each of the plagues in the book of Exodus were designed to mock one of the gods in the Egyptian polytheistic pantheon? Oh, you want to worship the Nile? I'll turn it to blood. You like frogs? I'll give you so many frogs you, don't want to do, you won't know what to do with them all. God has a tremendous sense of humor. And the whole point of this, God says, if you abandon me, I abandon you. Didn't we just learn back in verse 18 that men are suppressing a knowledge of God? Didn't uh, verse 21 tell us that we wouldn't honor and give thanks to God. Look at verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. You won't acknowledge me, you won't honor me, then I won't acknowledge and honor you. It's a sense of humor in a, in a, in a certain sense. Did you know in the Bible God gives up on people? Wow. Wow. Genesis 6, verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. You got 120 years, and that's it. This was quoted uh, last night. Dr. Reagan, I think, quoted this. Jeremiah 7, 16, As for you, do not pray for this people. Do not lift up or cry for them, and do not intercede, for I don't hear you. God gave up in terms of discipline upon Judah. You know, the people really wanted a king. Samuel was upset about that, because that wasn't God's will for the nation at that time. I mean, why would they pick Saul? Saul is even from the right tribe. Aren't the kings supposed to come from Judah? Saul came from which tribe? Benjamin. I mean, they, they got the whole thing wrong. They didn't even understand Genesis 49.10, which says the kings all come from Judah. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. I, I'm giving up. I'm giving them what they want. I found this very interesting quote by John Calvin. I'm not exactly what you call the poster boy for Calvinism. I like what Dave Hunt says in his book and others. But I, you know, John Calvin, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And I found, that, <laughs> I found this interesting quote he said here. It just fascinated me. He said, and he's explaining why nations are given over to unjust rulers. He says... And he's quoting in his Institutes, and then you'll find this in his commentary on Romans 13. He says, indeed, he says that those who rule for the public benefit are true patterns and evidence of the benefits of his. 
that they who rule unjustly or incompetently have been raised up by him to punish the wickedness of the people. Yet we need not labor to prove that a wicked king is the Lord's wrath upon the earth. For I believe that no man will contradict me, and thus nothing more would be said of a king, of a robber who seizes your possessions, of an adulterer who pollutes your marriage bed, of a murderer who seeks to kill you. For since a wicked prince is the Lord's scourge to punish the sins of the people, let us remember that it happens through our fault that this excellent blessing of God is turned into a curse. What he's saying here is you get bad rulers because you go along a certain path of abandonment and God starts giving you rulers that look like you. The book of uh, Isaiah talks about this in the final stages of Israel's discipline just prior to the captivity. It says in Isaiah 3 and verse 2, It says, I will make mere lads their princes, and capricious children will rule over them. Now, everybody's been asking me about Hillary and Trump. What do you think about Hillary and Trump? Well, here's Hillary here in verse 12. (laughs) Oh, my people, their oppressors are children, and women rule over my people. What what are we being told? We need the first woman president. Why? Is she qualified like Margaret Thatcher? No. We just need a woman president. That's a sign of the discipline of God when you just want somebody because of their gender rather than their qualifications. I'm not necessarily against a, a competent female leader. Margaret Thatcher, I thought, was a very good leader. I have my eye on Carly Fiorina. She didn't do as well as I wanted in the primary. Not against the gender. I I want competence. But what we're screaming out for is someone just based on their gender. That is the discipline of God. Oh, my people, their oppressors are children, and women rule over them. Boy, may God help us understand what's happening. You know, when I first came of age to vote, there was a choice. I came of age to vote in the 1984 presidential election, and I remember as an 18-year-old saying, look at these differences. We have the big government humanistic liberal over here, Walter Mondale, and we have the small government conservative Christian over here, Ronald Reagan. I could see a difference between them when I was 18. I, of course, proudly cast my vote for Ronald Reagan. And what I've noticed over my voting life is the differences between these candidates, Republican and Democrat, are shrinking, 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 To the point now, and I I largely agree with what David Reagan said the other night, I don't really see a lot of difference between these candidates. Who do you want? The criminal? Or do you want the guy that funded the criminal for years? What, what, what What do you make of this? It is the discipline of God that's happening to this culture. That's what the Bible says. You're, you're, you can go so far in, in divine abandonment that God begins to give you rulers that look an awful lot like yourself. So God gives humanity over to four things. Number one, impurity. Notice, if you will, verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Number two, God gives you over to what? Idolatry, verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. We've already talked about Gaia and the idolatry that our world and our culture is in. Then God gives you over to bizarre 
sexuality, in this case homosexuality, verses 26 and 27, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their er error. Sexuality, of course, is a gift from God. And as a designer of it, God gives us rules. Heterosexual monogamy, where that gift, the sex drive, is to be expressed. God knows what's going to mess us up chemically, emotionally, psychologically, and he gives us guidelines. You notice that they receive in their bodies the due penalty of their perversion. I think we need to start ca stop calling homosexuality gay. When we use the expression gay, which means happiness, right? Look it up in the dictionary. We're buying into their vocabulary. There's nothing gay or happy about that lifestyle. When you study the physical and psychological damage, emotional damage, spiritual damage you're under. See, the homosexual community, it's like somebody who is just tired of stoplights. I'm just tired of stoplights and stop signs, you know? Those are a restriction on my freedom and liberty. I'm just going to run every red light because I'm a free person, and we know how that's going to end up. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt somebody else. That's what the homosexual movement is essentially doing. The rules apply to everybody else, but not us. I'm not picking on homosexuality. I'm just bringing it up because Paul mentions it here. That's with every sin. And you can always tell, and this is what scares me, is how far a culture has gone under the wrath of God through a divine abandonment. The barometer of telling that is how popular is homosexuality in that culture. The degree of authority people give to homosexuality will give you a barometer or a test for discerning or ascertaining how far folks are, or how far a country is in divine abandonment. Can I ask you a question? Did you ever think the day would come where we would have a national conversation about what bathroom to use? Should a man use the men's room or the ladies' room? We're involved in a national dialogue about this. The Iranians are building nuclear weapons. The economy is tanking. Think of all of the things that we have to discuss, and this is where our, our focus of our attention is. This, beloved, is the result of divine abandonment. Divine abandonment gets so severe that those that are perverse gain the upper hand against the righteous. And yet another example of gay activist overreach, an Oregon official has not only burdened a Christian couple with a ridiculous fine, but he has imposed a gag order on them. A gag order? I thought this was the United States of America. In one of the most egregious anti-Christian acts committed by a state official in recent memory, Oregon Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian not only upheld a ridiculous $135,000 fine levied against Aaron and Melissa Klein. For what? Did they kill somebody? No, they declined to bake a cake for a lesbian commitment ceremony. But this judge ordered the clients to cease and desist from making any public statements about their religious convictions relative to the case. Look at that. You wonder what country we're living in. The last thing we're abandoned to is depravity. God gives us over to depravity. First of all, a depraved mind, verse 28. For just as they did not see fit to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind and to things which are improper. What is a depraved mind? A depraved mind is a brain that doesn't think right. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. Then it goes on. Remember the SAT scores? That's the depraved mind. 
Then God gives them over to depraved sins, verses 29 through 31, being filled with all unrighteousness and greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, and unloving. Look at that laundry list there. Look at that one, disobedient to parents. Who is the author of the parent-child relationship? God. You divorced yourself from God, you don't even have a basis for understanding the parent-child relationship any more than you have a basis for understanding sexuality. Our relationships become bizarre and strange and skewed as a result of divine abandonment. Finally, verse 32, we're given over to a depraved attitude. I call this the Jerry Springer verse. And although they knew the ordinance of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same thing, but they heartily approve of those who practice them. The doctrine of divine abandonment through that four-part outline. Well, I promised you some good news, didn't I, at the beginning? Anybody ready for some good news? <laughs> I'm ready for some good news, too. I'll do this very, very fast. Is America under the judgment of God? Yes, it is, based on the way I've described it. Is there good news in the midst of it? Here we go. Four pieces of good news. Number one, nothing is impossible for God. Genesis 18, 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? The Lord could write this ship if he wanted to. Doesn't look very promising from the human point of view, but it's possible. Second uh, piece of good news is God uses the ungodly for his own purposes. The ungodly run the show, fine, God can use them as well. Did you know that? Proverbs 21, verse 1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Do you know the king that was the good guy that brought the nation of Israel out of the captivity and allowed them to go back into their own land was a guy named Cyrus? That's the Cyrus Cylinder recording his boasts of conquering Babylon as the captivity started. Did you know Cyrus was an unbeliever? How do I know that? Isaiah 45, 4 says, Though of Cyrus, you have not known me. You mean the guy that God used to release the nation from the captivity wasn't even saved? Wasn't even a believer? That's true. So just because the unrighteous are in authority, certainly we would like it the other way, doesn't stop God's purposes or his hand at all. Number three, Intercessory prayer still works. The book of James chapter 5 and verse 16 says, The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In fact, did you know that Paul, writing to Timothy in the, in the, in the midst of one of the worst rulers ever, you, know, you think Trump is bad or Clinton is bad? Try, try Nero on for size. And this is what Paul says. First of all, I urge that you get on email and say every nasty thing you can. No, it doesn't say that. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tr tranquil and quiet life in all godliness. You know what I'm committing myself to doing? I'm going to just shut up about politics. I'm not going to post opinions anymore. Every time the subject comes up, I'm just going to pray. We have so much complaining that we do. I'm wondering if we pray as much as we complain. Because the biblical injunction is not to complain, it's to pray. And beloved, intercessory prayer still works. The fourth piece of good news, even though we're in the midst of the wrath of God through divine ab abandonment, is Jesus is still building his church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church as long as the Republicans can retain Congress. 
He says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Can I let you in on a little secret here? This is painful for me because if you cut me open, I'd bleed red, white, and blue. That's how much I love America. But here's something to understand. God doesn't need America. Did you know God did pretty good before America even existed? He graciously has used America. He doesn't need America. And guess what? Can I share this with you? Even if Hill and Bill make it back into the White House. Even if that happens, Matthew 16 still applies, doesn't it? Jesus is going to keep right on building his church. And so these are things we need to keep in mind as we watch our culture and our country move into the wrath of God through divine abandonment. Can I pray for us? Oh, Father, this is a heavy lesson today, and I'm grateful for this flock and audience that would hear such a teaching. I'm thankful for your, the truth of your word that gives us a wake-up call and a reminder where we're at. But even more than that, Lord, I'm thankful for this good news that we went over briefly here at the end. And you're still at work. You're still on the throne. You're not sitting there wringing your hands, wondering how you're going to pull this off. And we're grateful for your sovereignty and that you're all-powerful. I pray, Father, you'll continue to fortify us in this conference for these last days that we live in. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen.